evening for Yellow Bird Oil Murder and a Woman's Search for Justice in Indian Country with Sierra Crane Murdoch. I wanna say thank you to our co-sponsors for tonight's event, which is a thank you to the Legacy Projects Ambassadors Program, as well as the Communication Department. So we're here today because of the Legacy and Legacy Project Ambassadors Program, as well as the Communication Department. So just a few things about these two co-sponsors. The first is, if you're not familiar, CCM's Legacy Project is an engaging interdisciplinary program that we have here at the college, where we invite guest speakers from all different areas, all different academic disciplines to come in and share their experiences, their expertise, and maybe just their life stories. And we usually have a particular theme set for every year. Some of our themes have been on Hurricane Katrina, to the beat generation, to climate change, which this year's theme is war, peace, and healing. Now we have a branch of the Legacy Project, which is known as the Ambassadors Program, and that's what's brought us here tonight specifically. The Ambassadors Program is basically an extension of our classes, where it offers our faculty a unique opportunity to apply to bring in guest speakers for topics that might fall outside of our current theme of, let's say, war, peace, and healing. Um, to highlight just one of our great ambassador events in the past, we were able to host Days of Distraction author Alexandra Chang back in February, and that was brought to us by um, Dr. Jeff Peck from the English and Philosophy Department. So that just gives you an example of our ambassadors program. Now the Communication Department is a wonderful department here on the County College of Morris campus. We have um, different majors offered, such as communication, broadcasting, as well as journalism. You can take a variety of different courses, such as editing and publication design, intro to mass media, sports communication, and culture. And just if you are interested in knowing about some of our upcoming events, we have what I'm calling next week, uh, the week of Judith Human, on Thursday, April 29th at 7 p.m. We will have a Q&A with Judith Human, which was, um, she was so instrumental in the disabilities movement. And in preparation for her Thursday night event on Tuesday, April 27th at 7 p.m., we will be discussing the documentary Crip Camp. And the last thing I wanna just share with you is some of our contact information. If you wanna know more about the Legacy, uh, Legacy Project, you can email us at legacy at ccm.edu. You can find us on Instagram at CCM Legacy Project. And then you could also find us on the CCM webpage as well. Thank you so much for joining us today and I'm very excited. So I am going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Professor John Soltes. Thank you, Professor Gigliotti. Um, my name is John Soltes and I'm a professor here in the communication department at County College of Morris. I also serve as co-chair of the Legacy Project. Thank you for joining us this evening. And as a special thanks, please, for our distinguished guest, journalist and author, Sierra Crane Murdoch. Sierra has led an impressive career, one that can be a real model for students at CCM and beyond. Her latest triumph is the publication of the critically acclaimed book, Yellow Bird, Oil, Murder, and a Woman's Search for Justice in Indian Country, which was released in 2020 by Random House. In addition to that book, which was hailed as a must read by many outlets, Sierra has been published by This American Life, Harper's, The New Yorker Online, The Atlantic, and High Country News, among many other news organizations. Tonight, we'll be diving into the issues brought up in this new book. Now, I'm sure each and every one of you has read these 350 plus pages, but in case there are a few of you who have not quite finished, I'd like to offer just some opening statements about the remarkable story at the center of this enlightening and ultimately sad and distressing narrative. Sierra's real life protagonist is a woman by the name of Lissa Yellowbird, an enrolled member of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Erikra nation, known as the three affiliated tribes, who once farmed the bottomlands of the Missouri River, as we learn in the book. <laughs> 
Today, after the US government flooded much of their expansive resources, the tribe's land is located more upland in the prairie of Western North Dakota, otherwise known as the Fort Berthold Reservation. Lissa is a fascinating, complicated character. She's described as insatiably curious about the world, yet remarkably uncurious about herself. In the book, Sierra documents Lissa's struggles with addiction and criminality, the difficult relationship she has with her children and extended family, plus her undeniable connection to the land of the reservation and her familial bonds with the tribe's elders. You see, after Lissa went to jail, sobered up and got her life back in order, she returned to Fort Berthold Reservation to find a beloved home that had changed in the intervening years. Thanks to the so-called back in oil boom, the tribe and its members saw their day-to-day -day lives change drastically and there were prospects for a better, more lucrative future. All of a sudden their population dramatically increased as they welcomed and housed large groups of non-native workers on the reservation, some of them representing large corporate interests and almost all looking to make a buck for the liquid gold beneath the dirt of this ancestral land. There were also other changes that had occurred, newfound wealth for some tribal members, but not all. There was also violence and criminality, addiction and death. Sierra explores these issues in real time and she finds many common narrative threads, namely the reality and ravages of intergenerational trauma that has been inherited throughout the years, dating all the way back to the 19th century and beyond. A time when other tribes, all tribes really had more freedom and land throughout what is today called the American West. We learn about Lissa because this real life character takes readers on a journey into the heart of a missing persons case. After all, this is a true crime tale. Unfortunately, murders and kidnappings are all too familiar on Indian reservations and in nearby locations. For example, incidents of murdered and missing women have led to a national campaign under the letters MMIW. And these tragic cases have impacted many tribes across the United States. I remember my own travels on the Crow Reservation a couple of years ago with my colleagues here at CCM. We were receiving a tour of the local area with our friend who was an enrolled member of the Crow Nation. As we left the Billings, Montana area and headed for Crow Agency, right around the site of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, he pointed out the missing persons in the area. And for him, it was a deeply important issue to raise awareness about, a story of violence that often goes unreported. Now in Yellowbird, it actually involves a different type of missing persons case. Lissa is a native woman investigating the whereabouts of a non-native white worker who has come to the reservation because of the oil boom. At the start of the story, there are many questions, many theories, many thoughts on what may have happened to Christopher Clark and who may have been involved. The actual details of the case and the answers that Lissa and the authorities found will keep you speedily going through the pages to the end of Yellowbird. We'll talk tonight about why Lissa might have been driven to find this person and other missing people, letting the case consume almost every day of her life for years. And by extension, Sierra is included in this quest to find answers. As a journalist, she worked for eight years on this immersive investigation to get at the truth. And tonight that's the focus of our conversation, the truth and how the mistreatment of Native Americans and the history of genocide still have reverberations in today's society and how one woman sought justice for a man she did not know and perhaps even redemption for herself who she finds along the way. And without further ado, it is my honor to welcome Sierra Crane Murdoch to the Legacy Projects Ambassadors Program. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. That was a wonderful introduction and a beautiful, beautiful summary of the book, <laughs> which I appreciate. But I know it's uh, many layered and um, there has multiple narrative threads. Uh, it's not the simplest um, narrative. And so uh, thank you for kind of touching on all of those pieces at once. Absolutely. I really found it a remarkable piece of journalism. Um, maybe to look at the origins of this project, can you bring me back a little bit on kind of why you're interested as a journalist in, in the American West and in this kind of part of the world? Sure, yeah. Um, so I, you know, I'm not from the West. I actually grew up in upstate New York. Um, 
And my first time living out West was getting a job um, with this magazine, High Country News, a small magazine based in Colorado that covers all things related to the American West. Um, I, I, it was my first job out of college. Um, I drove out to Colorado. Um, I moved into this tiny town called Paonia. And my first assignment for that magazine, um, which was a wonderful place to work as a beginning journalist, because they actually sent you out into the field to report stories. You weren't just fact checking or doing, you know, office logistics. Um, uh, I, my first assignment was to go to North Dakota to the Bakken oil fields and to write about this tribal nation, the MHA nation, um, and about uh, this kind of burgeoning oil boom. The oil boom was just beginning at the time. And I was interested in the fact that this was a community that had, you know, been moved multiple times, um, that uh, had found itself on pieces on top of this piece of land that, you know, they considered like pretty much infertile um, and had really struggled with poverty for a long time because of those dispossessions. Um, and then had found themselves, you know, in the midst of this just massive resource boom. Um, and so I can't say that before I was put onto this story that I really like had much of, of you know, more a fascination about indigenous issues than any other issue. But through this story, through this first assignment, it became, it, it did become my beat in a sense. Um, just because, you know, when I arrived and when I began interviewing people, I began to learn a lot about the way that like land ownership works in the United States, the way that access to indigenous resources works in the United States. I began to learn a lot about the history of that land dispossession and also the history of genocide, the history of boarding schools, these layers of trauma that you mentioned in your intro. Um, I began to learn about all these things that, you know, like I didn't learn growing up in public school. Um, and uh, I was, um, I also recognized that, you know, there was a, there was a steep learning curve. There was a lot to understand about indigenous land and, and, um, and ownership and corporate access and, and federal Indian law. Um, and once I was in it, once I was having to learn all those things in order to sort of accurately and um, accurately report these stories and, and write nuanced stories, um, it just let, one story led to another. And so um, I just kind of, I, I kept going back to this reservation and I went back to other reservations, wrote other stories about land rights. Um, and it was, yeah, writing about indigenous issues really just became became my beat um, while I was at High Country News and then and then later when I freelanced for other publications. I'm curious, um, you talk about the connection to the land and the history of, of this um, particular um, uh, reservation and these three tribes, and they have a very real kind of um, kind of metaphor that's right there with the waters that are near the reservation and the flooding that took place. Could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that history of how that shaped um, a little bit of the land up there? Yeah, sure. And it's, I mentioned this just briefly in the book, but it's not even, it's not, you know, limited to just this tribe. Um, but, you know, in the 1940s and 50s, emerging out of World War II, um, Congress uh, adopted what was called the Pick Sloan Plan, um, which built a series of dams along the Missouri River. Um, and flooded out um, multiple reservations, actually, flooded out the most um, arable land on, on multiple reservations. Um, and you had, you know, thousands and thousands of Native families who were um, dislocated from uh, their original land. Um, and dislocated from land that, um, you know, uh, that Congress had, had um, granted or had sort of like divided up and granted to individual families as part of what was called the Allotment Act um, about a, a century earlier, less than a century earlier. Um, so on Fort Berthold, you know, 90% of the families lived in the bottomlands of the Missouri River, and they were very much self-sufficient. Um, you have a really big farming culture. Farming was 
a part of um, the Mandan Hadat Senebrikwa cultures even prior to them being forced onto the reservation and forced onto these allotments. Um, a lot of like species of corn, of beans, um, a lot of like the original sort of American crops were developed and cultivated by these tribes. Um, and uh, the communities managed to really weather like the Great Depression in a way that their white neighbors weren't able to. But then when they were moved from the bottomlands up higher, um, suddenly, you know, the rates of unemployment skyrocketed. Um, families were very much like divided and scattered across um, like a, a vast <laughs> um, air, area of land. And so there was less community. It was harder to get places, especially if you didn't have a car. Um, and it really broke down sort of the social and economic and in many ways, political structure of this community. Um, and so, yeah, it really was just in the last, you know, 60, 70 years that the tribe has been struggling with um, much higher rates of poverty and much higher rates of, um, of you know, substance abuse, the, the sorts of things that, you know, a lot of non-Native people sort of associate when they think of reservations, right? These are not, the, these are sort of symptoms of, you know, a, a much bigger problem, which was this land dispossession and and um, losing autonomy and sovereignty in, in their lot, lives, both economically and politically. So the oil boom brings you there for a journalism assignment. Um, is it very visible when you got there that the oil boom was changing everything about the landscape and about even the culture and the housing you mentioned in the book as well too? Is, was it very visible that this was becoming an enormous industry in the area? Not initially, actually. Um, when I first arrived on the reservation, this was in 2011, it was very much the beginning of the boom on the reservation. The boom had kind of like, you know, popped up in the surrounding towns. But on the reservation, there was a little bit of a complication, right? Because in order for oil companies to actually drill there, they had to go through a longer process to access that land. So they had to go through federal agencies um, in order to uh, you know, get permission to drill on certain tribal members' allotments and on the tribal allotments. Um, and in order to do that, they went to auction um, with some of these parcels. Um, a lot of oil companies just were like knocking on people's doors, um, just asking them if they could, you know, sign over the rights to drill. Um, and that was, you know, that was a very long process of, of oil companies sort of digging up all these names. And in many cases, the companies would hire, would find sort of individuals within the tribe who had some sort of clout either through their families or through their political position within the tribe. Um, and then they would hire those people to go in and to get their relatives or get their friends, their community members to sign. Um, so when I arrived on the reservation, I was right at the tail end of that, right? So when I arrived, all of the land on the reservation had now been leased to oil companies but it was just beginning to be drilled. And so um, it really wasn't until 2013 when I um, went back to work on a different story um, that I noticed just all of a sudden this explosion, you know, which um, it was just like, yeah, just the land being torn up. I think I described in the book, like in places it looked like the, like a giant had just you know, press their fingers into clay. It's just like earth moving on a massive scale <laughs> um, and, uh, and trucks, you know, just like lines and lines of trucks, um, traffic for hours sitting, sitting in one place on the roads, um, dust, just these huge clouds of dust. Um, and then at night when the sun went down, the reservation would just glow with these flares. And, you know, it, it looked like campfires everywhere. Um, and uh, in the center of the reservation is the reservoir, the lake, Lake Sakakawea, which was created when um, that flood happened, when the dam was built. And, um, and so you can sort of stand on the edge of the lake and look around and just see like the entire um, edge of the lake just kind of like flaring up with these, um, with these uh, gas, it's gas being burned off at the wellhead. Um, right before we get to Lissa Yellowbird, I'm curious, mm -hmm. just one final question about this oil boom is, um, 
when in your interviews with with um, with Native Americans um, that were really maybe conflicted about welcoming in outside interests, um, with that camp comes a lot of what you said. You know, um, changes to the land, um, um, like physical landscape, but also the promise for you know possible um, possible money, you know, possible mm -hmm. um, security. Um, did you notice in your interviews that there was a conflict that kind of happens on a personal level about, you know, selling the leases that already happened, but just seeing all the development? Yes, and there are kind of two parts to that question. You know, first, I should say that um, tribal members didn't have a lot of um, a, a lot of say or autonomy in whether or not their land would get drilled. And this is like a long complicated <laughs> historical note that I won't get deeply into, but let me see if I can summarize it. I mean, so in, um, in the late 1800s, land on all reservations across the country through the Homestead Act um, and the Dawes Act was divided up into like 80 and 160 acre parcels. And those parcels were assigned to individual family members on these reservations. Um, and the, the point was that then the rest, the leftovers that weren't assigned could then be granted through the Homestead Act to non-Native people who wanted to homestead it. So as a result, actually, you know, in many cases, a third of all reservation land um, and oftentimes more is actually owned and farmed or just lived on, managed by non-Native people. Um, so I don't think, I think most Americans don't quite realize that, that actually um, even, the, even the tribe and even the individual tribal members don't often have control of their, over their reservation land. Um, then the land that was given to these individual families, um, those families, have grown over the past century or more, right? And, and so those parcels are now owned in common in this sort of like French system of land ownership called fractionation. Those parcels are owned in common with these families. And so in order for the oil companies to gain access to, those land, to that land, they just had to get over 50% of the landowners on those parcels, on those tracks to, to sign, right? And so, they were just, you know, looking for people who are willing to take that money. Um, so you had a lot of tribal members who had no interest whatsoever in leasing out their land, but because that land was owned by so many owners through this history of, of you know, like the federal government determining how land would be divided and inherited, um, they had no choice in it. So, um, that was a lot of the conflict I heard, right? When I would interview um, tribal landowners, you know, some were kind of excited, right? Because some, the ones who managed to sort of maintain big, big chunks of land over time, or maybe had smaller families, so it hadn't been divided up as much. Um, those people were earning potentially quite a bit of money. Um, and yeah, that was very exciting, right? Like to have something you never had before. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, for a lot of people, though, too, even people who were earning that money they were, you know, they didn't, they didn't want their land to be drilled, you know, they had, um, they were concerned about the environmental impacts, they were concerned about the trucks being there, they were concerned, um, they were concerned sometimes about what money was going to do to their family, right, like, money doesn't solve problems, <laughs> it deepens them often, <laughs> um, you know, so certainly there were a lot of families that were going to really benefit um, from it, but um, some too, you know, um, really struggled with that sort of like instant wealth because they'd been struggling for a long time and, and it didn't, the money didn't necessarily take away certain family struggles. Your protagonist um, in the book mm. is, is, is a really, really um, uh, interesting um, person and, and you really do pretty much give um, almost her entire life story. A lot of um, we learn throughout these 300 plus pages about Lissa Yellowbird. Could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of when you first met her and when you started to realize that you'd like to, you know, write a, a form of long form journalism about her? Yeah, so I've been going back to the reservation to write more specifically about crime and about the rising crime. Um, the tribe 
you know, tribes across the country have no criminal jurisdiction over non-members who commit crimes on their reservations. Um, that's through a Supreme Court case from 1978. Um, so on Fort Berthold, where there was suddenly this like massive influx of, um, of uh, non-native oil workers, most of them just going there to try to kind of like resurrect themselves post Great Recession, you know, um, but some who, uh, some realized that they could, you know, kind of like act without impunity as well. Um, and so, uh, in 2012, right, there was the disappearance of this young oil worker from the reservation, Christopher Clark, um, and Lissa became really interested in trying to figure out what had happened to him. And I heard about his disappearance as well, um, because it had kind of upended the politics of the tribe in this really interesting way. And so I had decided to go back and I was going to write about this crime. I was going to write about what happened to this oil worker and, and try to figure figure out the case, but then also kind of see, use that case as like a window into this oil boom and a way to kind of understand the oil boom in a more complex way. Um, so I went and I went to sort of investigate this kit, this crime, and I went to um, report on like the election, the new tribal election and sort of the way it had this crime had sort of blown apart the reputation of one of the tribe's, you know, main leaders. Um, and uh, when I was there, um, someone who I knew from the reservation, actually the editor of the local paper said, hey, you're interested in that? Like, well, let me introduce you to Lissa Yellowbird. She's been searching for Casey Clark, the oil worker for, you know, years. And so um, I, I uh, was, of course, fascinated and wanted to meet her. Um, and like, as soon as I did, I realized first, like, what a dynamic person she was. Um, she's just, she's charismatic. She's like, she's just a fascinating person. You meet her and you want to know everything about her. Um, but second, I, what I hadn't realized, right, when I just heard, oh, she's been involved in this case was that she wasn't just involved in the case, she was like centrally, like she had placed herself centrally within this case. Um, and she had really infiltrated the community of people who she believed was responsible for Casey Clark's disappearance. Um, and she had the documents to kind of prove it. And so she invited me to Fargo where she was living at the time. And she would go, you know, she would go to the welding shop where she worked during the day, but, you know, she'd leave at like 5 a.m. and she'd turn on her computer and she would just let me sift through her entire hard drive and download whatever I wanted. Um, and it was like an enormous amount of trust <laughs> that she placed in me. But in the process of kind of sifting through these documents, um, I was able to see that she potentially had been critical in kind of breaking open this case in, in really unusual, non-traditional ways, right? Like in ways that didn't necessarily um, please law enforcement, but ways nonetheless that were um, kind of critical. Absolutely. Uh, even via Facebook. Facebook is kind of a, a big player in, in the story. Right. Yeah. She, yeah. I'm, I'm curious when, when you get this kind of all these files on the computer and access, I mean, it's probably daunting as a journalist in some ways, but it also is a bit of a, you know, it's like a treasure trove. You really have so much that you can go through. Did those files, did what she kept, the messages, um, did that really help shape a lot of the narrative? It did. Yeah. I mean, you know, the narrative is, has so many facets to it, right? There's, there's a highly emotional story in its core, right? Which is the story of Lissa and our relationship to her family and her children and this generation of women and kind of like moving through time in within their family to sort of understand this legacy of white violence, right? So there's, there are these more qualitative, you know, kind of um, pieces to that story that were what really inspired me. But as a journalist, you know, like I still needed some chronology, right? Like I still needed a timeline. And I also needed, you know, kind of proof that like these conversations that existed, especially because a lot of the people who she had been talking to were not interested in talking to me now. <laughs> um, and so, you know, how could I actually know what their role in the story was without talking to them? Well, I, I had their conversations with Lissa. Um, 
So yeah, it was a tremendous gift as a journalist to be able to rely on that. And I really did rely on those conversations as a way to kind of like understand what happened when in the book and to really piece together kind of like the murder mystery aspect of this story. Um, so, yeah. I'm curious of um, whether Lissa understood when she kind of gave you that trust and said yes, um, how much she would become a personal character in the piece. Um, did she realize that, she, you know, she would be talking about her children, her children would be interviewed, her mother, her grandmother, um, or does that come later when you build even more trust? Yeah, that came a little bit later. Um, so when I first met Lissa, I was working on this as a magazine story and I had pitched it you know, as a magazine story and pitched it to everyone I was writing about as a, you know, like I'm, I'm doing this story about this crime and I just want to understand everything I can about it. And so Lisa had invited me to Fargo thinking, oh, Sierra's going to write about this crime, you know, and, and I have a lot of information about it. So I'll give that to her. But it was through kind of sifting through that information, right, that I began to see her as the central character you know, the central protagonist in this story, because, you know, not only is she so dynamic, not only is she so charismatic, not as only is she so involved in this story, but, you know, like she can see the boom in a much more interesting way than I can, right? So like seeing the boom through her eyes, I might be able to understand it in more nuance right, then, then just sort of like myself being the passive observer in a story in which I'm, you know, pretending to sort of like unbiasedly observe, you know, this place and, and, and this um, uh, order of events, you know. Um, and so, you know, that was, and that was a more exciting challenge to me to really sort of like understand it through her eyes and through her family's eyes. Um, and I, and it felt like it would be, you know, a more honest, and more compelling book, right? Because she's from there, this is her home. Um, but also she's from there, but she like had been gone from there for a critical period of time. She'd been in prison, she'd been addicted to crack and to meth and she'd been kind of like outside of her community. And so in some ways she was coming back to it with some fresh eyes. So she both had that freshness of perspective and she had this, this intimacy with the place. Um, yeah. What why do you think, uh, you actually asked this question in the book and try to answer it, um, of why she became so interested in this particular case, but really it extends beyond this case to many missing persons cases. Um, I hate to ask the question you asked in the book, but why do you think she really is so interested? Um, you know, she, she seems to really care about the outcome. She, she um, makes uh, um, a connection with the families often um, and tries to sometimes give them, you know, solace, give them perspective. Um, I'm just curious of why you think she feels this is part of a mission in some ways. Yeah, I mean, um, you're asking this question, right? Because I raised the question at the very beginning of the book and then I don't entirely answer it. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I couldn't entirely answer it, you know, because her reasons, her motivations evolved over time, like just as we all kind of evolve, <laughs> like, and as characters even evolve in fiction, you know, she, her, her reasons for what she was doing weren't stagnant, you know? Um, and I, I think, you know, like it would be nice if we all had sort of like narrative <laughs> clarity and knew like, you know, motive like results you know um but uh she you know in the beginning right i i write about how you know one of theory which she kind of agrees with but it's sort of put forth by her old, eldest daughter is that she's replacing one addiction for another right so she had this addiction she's someone who's like sort of has an inclination toward addictions or obsessions and and so now she has this obsession to kind of like take its place and to and to not you know relapse and and um to sort of like channel her energy towards something more positive but then you know lissa came to this point right where she began to think like wait you know, not only do I have this just 
somewhat random obsession with trying to find this kid, right? I mean, it, it was ran it was random. <laughs> it was also this was her home. She was interested in the fact that he had disappeared from her tribal chairman's property and she just has this like strong sense of justice like why is no one paying attention to this crime like why you know someone has to do something about this right um but she also in the process of searching for him and then being called by other family fam other families like across the midwest upper midwest and west to help them search for their own loved ones she began to realize that she also had kind of like emotional an emotional connection to this right and that the people she's looking for are the kinds of people who just don't really get looked for right who get kind of like passed over by society whose lives aren't considered necessarily like worthy um and she was uh, she felt that she had been someone whose life hadn't been entirely worthy right she was an addict she was you know um like a mother of five children um who had had her children taken away from her at various points, you know, she had burned a lot of bridges in her life because of her addiction. And, and she knew that there were points in her life where like, had she disappeared, which is highly likely when you're a woman and you're, you're addicted to drugs, um, then, you know, she wonders like, who, who would have looked for her? Um, who would have noticed, right? And so um, she wanted to be the person who was noticing. And, um, and she has since then, and she's, you know, she's had sort of boots on the ground searching for um, largely indigenous people, not just women, um, you know, she was really concerned about the high rates of missing and murdered indigenous men as well, and children, um, men go missing, um, she suspects at a higher rate than even women. Um, but, you know, mostly are victims of other men. Um, that's, I think that's why, like, women, you know, are, get, are getting a lot of attention, um, which makes a lot of sense, but, um, but it's an issue she's current, concerned about as well. I just have a couple more questions, then we're going to see what the audience thinks. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just kind of to bring us up to now 2021. Um, I hope Lissa is doing well. And I, um, I know that um, also a little bit, the oil boom has changed completely. Um, and you talk about this towards the end too. Could you just give, give us a little bit of an update on, on the story, if you wouldn't mind? Um, you know, it's, it's been about a year now since it's been published and probably longer since your reporting was done. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, let's see, what has happened? Um, so, I mean, the oil boom has really slowed um, the price of oil is way down. And so, um, you know, it, it hasn't, uh, the Bakken hasn't experienced that sort of like massive spike. And also something I write about in the book is that how, you know, booms are like inherently inefficient in their beginnings, <laughs> you know, like companies were just like scrambling to sort of, you know, build as fast as they can, get the oil out of the ground as fast as they can. And so they're not very efficient in their hiring. And so that's why you have this sort of like not this explosion of, of people um, in those places, an explosion of construction. The construction isn't very efficient either. Um, so yeah, the boom has pretty much ended. Um, there's still people obviously working there in the oil fields. There's oil still pumping, but just at a slower rate. As far as Lissa, um, she's doing really well. Um, she, uh, it, you know, it's been kind of like a tough year for everyone. Um, her grandma passed away um, uh, just a month and a half ago, um, which is very sad. Uh, she, her grandma is a big character in the book, um, uh, Madeline Yellowbird. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's been hard. She's, she's moved back to the reservation. She had moved back to care for her uncle and for her grandma and both of them have now passed. So she's sort of figuring out what's next um, and uh, still looking for missing and murdered. Um, still, you know, answering people's calls when they call. Um, and uh, she's actually fostering right now um, two boys um, whose mother uh, is in a similar situation to what Lissa went through and, and sort of specifically asked if Lissa would become her foster mother. And so um, I actually um, have written an essay about the experience of being a white woman who's not been a mother yet, uh, being asked by an agency um, to uh, 
uh, judge whether Lissa, who's been a mother five times over, is fit to be a mother, and sort of the long history of you know who gets to be a mother in America, and and um, and the history of like um, Native women having their children taken from them um, through boarding schools and then through the foster care system. Um, so uh, yeah, that will be out uh, later this summer. But um, we've been kind of working on that together. So. I could keep asking questions. <laughs> I think we'd like to um, um, turn it over to the audience. Um, and we see that we have a lot of questions that came in. Great. So um, Professor Gigliotti, if you can also help me with this, because I know you'll have to help unmute these, but I think we'll go to Dr. Jill Shenham. She's a colleague and a friend of mine. And uh, Jill, whenever you're unmuted, um, please ask away. Still there, Jill? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, there she is. There we go. Okay, hopefully I'm unmuted now, right? <laughs> You're good. Okay, so I have a question because like, well, I would have methodological questions because I'm an anthropologist. Mm. I don't want to go there yet. <laughs> Instead, I kind of have thematic questions to begin with. Because I think it's really interesting that your book um, like is sort of covers all these different thematic issues. And I also think you, in the way you present your book, you talk in the voices of different people. So like at the end, you really have this journalistic voice, which is um, written from the perspective of a journalist. And in the first few quarters, you don't have that, you know? Mm -hmm. To me, that was really interesting the way you chose to do that. But I just found it interesting that like the normal themes that I would think would be explored weren't really, they <laughs> were, but they were complicated. So like a normal theme would be, here's the huge extractive industry, oil coming in, it's ripping apart the thing. It's obviously not gonna be there for very long. Another huge theme would be, um, like what is happening to American women as they are murdered and disappeared. And we know that happens uh, across reservations, but you choose to focus mm -hmm. on the oil worker. Mm -hmm. so, um, I, you know, I was wondering about that. It's not the themes you would expect. So <laughs> I just thought that was interesting and I wondered if you could address them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like as you, have identified there are so many directions I could have gone with this book right but I was interested in telling a story that is representative of real life in the sense that it connects right all of these issues um, in such a way that you know you can't extract one from the other um, and uh, you know I yeah so all of this felt important to me, right? But I, I did need to have a focus. The focus was the story, right? The focus was like the narrative thread. Um, I came to Lissa because she was searching for this oil worker. Um, two of the biggest things that drew me to the story itself um, were A, Lissa herself, right? That Like I could have this complex, central character who is a woman who is kind of both the hero and the anti-hero of her own story um, who is able to kind of like express her flaws in these um, very honest ways and still um, come out as like a, an empathetic person. <laughs> um, I, you know, I was drawn to this story really because of her as a protagonist. And so if, if she was my thread, you know, like what were what were the diversions I could go on, right? The, the diversions I could go on were either sort of my own observations of the oil boom or her observations of the oil boom or sort of the connection of those two. Um, and so I, I tried to keep it somewhat contained to her in that sense, you know, I had to have some container around this story and, and she was certainly the container. Um, she wasn't searching for missing and murdered indigenous women when um, I began this book. And in fact, that really wasn't much of a touchstone issue in the United States. It was a big issue in Canada. It's been a big issue in Canada for a long time, but um, it hadn't really arrived in the US. 
Um, it really wasn't until Standing Rock, um, first when her niece disappeared, um, which I touch on briefly in the final chapter of the book. Um, and then when at Standing Rock, you had this sort of coming together of all these tribes, right? And all these different um, Native American interest groups um, that then were able to really coordinate. And I think the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women movement, the movement around that issue really emerged out of Standing Rock and the coming together of all these tribal um, and indigenous entities. Um, and then the, um, which I also mentioned in the last chapter of the book, the disappearance of Savannah Greywind in Fargo, which was a case that Lissa worked on. And that was the case that really kind of broke open that issue in the United States. Um, so yeah, I don't, you know, I don't talk about it much in the book. I also really liked the fact that, you know, I, I think there is, I've written a lot about um, the victimization of Native women um, before. And, and there was something, there, there was something um, that felt, it felt important to write kind of this subversion, really an inversion of the white savior narrative, right? Like this is a native woman who's searching for a white guy. <laughs> um, and uh, that was like, that was very new. You know, there are so many white savior narratives when it comes to Indian country and indigenous issues. And, and I was drawn to that inversion um, of that typical narrative. Um, and, and also, you know, in my journalism, I have noticed this sort of like inclination toward, toward like victimization of, Native women. And, and I think that's like, those stories are so important, but I also have wondered like, how do, you know, can those stories sort of like re-victimize or do those stories sort of um, reinforce this like victim narrative? Um, and like, how do you, how do you tell those stories without doing that, <laughs> without reinforcing that victim narrative? And, and to have someone as strong as Lissa, who is who was as vulnerable as many of those women who she's searching for be at the center of a story and sort of show her agency and show her brilliance and show sort of how active she is in this world um, was, uh, was really exciting and also I think essential for this book. Thank you, Dr. Shenham. I think um, the next person on the list is Josiah. So Josiah, in just about a second, you'll be able to unmute yourself if you have a question. Sure. Thank you, um, Professor Soltes, for this great presentation, by the way. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. it. Um, my question is, how did the um, oil boom really happen? And where, what state or one country did this really happen? Was this from Canada or was this from the United States? Um, so the oil boom began around 2008. It's, um, it actually does kind of go a little bit into Saskatchewan. Um, but mainly most of the Bakken region is in the US and it covers mainly Western North Dakota, um, also a little bit of Eastern Montana and then yes, yeah, Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, so, uh, so primarily the US. Um, and yeah, it, it started you know, outside the reservation in 2008 and then kind of like exploded around there and then sort of entered the reservation more in 2010. Thank you. And I think we go to John, uh, John Carroll next. So just in a second, you'll be able to unmute yourself. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, and thank you for speaking tonight. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Um, I guess my my only question really was that honestly, throughout the entire um, thing, I was really getting some like uh, Wind River vibes, speaking of white favorism, um, which don't get me wrong, amazing movie. And but the same, um, I definitely felt like I, I was getting pulled in a lot of different directions, the way that the story obviously goes. But I think my main question really is that, how should we, since you're like a, a, a smart, an expert on the, on the situation, how should we try and help people in those environments and those situations, especially in an area with Native American or First, First Nations people where Autonomy, autonomy, autonomy and sovereignty is not something that they have. So they look to us as people going into their areas to benefit them. And yet those, those, these same 
under like not I wouldn't say underdeveloped, but underprivileged environments and societies ha don't have the resources to support areas with drug addiction, alcoholism, children that aren't that aren't being able to be watched. Um, how do you boost that economy when you can't if, if you can't bring those kinds of um, oil companies or other areas that would go to South North Dakota? What 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 else is in North Dakota? There's oil in North Dakota. Like that's what they got. Like so. One would think that that would all lead to some kind of justification for going in there, but at the same time, like, how do we find balance? And also, as a second part, and I understand that that was a big question, so I apologize <laughs> for that, but I have to ask what organizations are there for helping or getting involved with for women that are missing in our First Nations people, uh, for like people that want to get involved in trying to help? Yeah, great questions. Um, oh, so I had so many thoughts firing. <laughs> Let's see if I can remember them. Um, yeah, I mean, okay. First, I just you know, you brought up Wind River, right? The movie Wind River. Um, like, right, beautifully shot movie. Great actors, you know, great director. Yeah, beautiful piece of art. The story. <laughs> is so far off from anything I've ever observed ever in Indian country, right? Like the people who are doing the most for native communities are other native people, right? They're the people who are from the communities where they are. And so, you know, I think the first thing to remember, right, is that like as much as you can, as much as we can sort of like honor the sovereignty of tribes because sovereignty exists, like it's it's been severely you know um, undermined over through like many federal laws through like many many generations of um, of like federal interference right it's it's been an undermined but it exists it exists by treaty um, and so um, you know as much as like non-native communities can support the sovereignty of tribes and, and honor that sovereignty, um, you know, the more that tribes will be able to sort of like regain their ability to care for their own people, to develop their own economies in the way that they see, you know, most effective. Um, the thing with resource booms, right, is that the, um, you know, the consequences are usually concentrated, right? But the benefits disperse. So most of the money, most of the profits, right, are being earned by the companies, by workers, and those entities are leaving, right? Um, whereas like, yeah, maybe the landowners earn some money, but it's like pretty scattered in terms of who actually earns that money. Um, it's really like, um, it's also really unequal, right? Because you have some families that own a tremendous amount of land because of the history of fractionation. And then you have some that own nothing and they're getting all the consequences, but none of the benefits. So you have this sort of deepening of economic divisions within the tribe. Um, and, and that creates its own social and economic problems, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would suggest, I mean, like I'm, I'm not great at sort of recommending solutions because I think, you know, there are so many people who are thinking about this constantly who are more, um, who, are, who have better ideas than I do. Um, the first thing I think that like non-native people can do in America is to read, <laughs> just like really understand as much as you possibly can about the history of dispossession, the history of that undermining of sovereignty, and, and also read work by native writers um, who are sort of reinforcing the narrative that these tribes actually do still have sovereignty, that they still are thriving in many ways, that there are tribes that are doing really interesting things that are helping their communities. Um, one of the best books for this, I think, is David Troyer's um, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. And it's really a response to the book, the D. Brown's famous book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, which kind of was a wonderful book, right? But like reinforced this narrative that Native Americans are dead. <laughs> They've been wiped out. What's left is just, you know, just poverty and trauma. 
um, which just is not, you know, it's not a helpful narrative. Like certainly there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of poverty, but there are also people who are moving past that and who are doing really wonderful things for their communities. Um, so yeah, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, it's a great book. You like learn a lot about, um, you know, what tribes actually are doing that's been really positive. Um, uh, David Treyer also, I mentioned this to, um, uh, to John earlier, David Troyer had a um, cover story in The Atlantic that came out last week, um, which is about um, ideas for reparations for tribes and, and the land back movement. Like, how do we actually begin to sort of return, not necessarily the ownership, but at least the management of land um, to tribes? Um, and uh, that had like a really interesting history and, and some interesting ideas in there as well. Um, so yeah, education, self-education, I think is the first thing. Um, missing and murdered indigenous women. There are a number of organizations that are doing work on that. Um, uh, I mean, Lissa would say, right, that like, we just need more boots on the ground. We need more people who are out there searching. Um, and that's what she's doing. Um, there are uh, organizations that could even, I could send you a list, um, you know, if you wanted, but um, like Sovereign Bodies Institute um, is doing a lot of really great work around missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to just like look up others, but um, uh, yeah. Native American, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, active place. <laughs> you learn a lot. So um, <laughs> lots of like great, uh, great, like young indigenous leaders to follow who are doing really like fantastic work in all these areas. We just have time maybe for just three more real quick questions, if that's okay. Um, yeah. We have um, one person who'd like to talk, uh, Cameron, and if in just a second um, you'll be unmuted, you can ask your question and then we'll finish up with two more quick questions. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Wanted to thank you for being able to take the time to talk to all of us today. Um, so my question is, how do you handle being empathetic and understanding during those social interactions, showing those people that you do care and you do want to understand? How do you let those people know that you want to share a part of their story and their truths? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I mean, in, in the beginning, right? Um, I will say that one of the things I love about reporting in indigenous communities is that like people I've found, especially like when I go into reservations, like people have different expectations of you, right? Like you're not gonna just like walk in with your list of questions and say, I need this answered and this answered and this answered, right? Like, like people are expecting that you show up as another person to have a conversation and potentially a very long conversation, right? So like I, you know, when I first am reporting in a new place, it's really hard for me to get someone on the phone if they don't know me, they don't trust me yet. But if I show up at their tribal office or at their house or, you know, at their workplace, wherever, and, you know, I'm willing to sit down, like oftentimes people will give me a lot of time. Um, and so I think it's just, um, it's showing up, it's patience, being willing to just like listen to sort of the context around the questions that you're asking, just like really understanding them and their stories in, in full. Um, you know, I think that sometimes journalism feels very limited by time, right? Especially news journalism or, or like quick turnover stories where it's like you only have so much time to finish a story and so you really need your questions answered. Um, but often, you know, that's not really the kind of journalism I'm drawn to because like often that precludes all the context around it that really help you understand it in its, in its fullest form. Um, and especially when you're reporting on communities that are not your own, that have a complicated racial history and violent history, you know, that you are a part of, um, there, you know, there's a lot you could get wrong. And, and so it takes time and it takes patience. And um, I think that's been, that's just been my key, you know, and, and not everyone, not everyone's willing to open up, like people have different levels of 
trust, people have different levels of trauma, people have different um, perspectives on who should know what and who should receive which information. Um, but, uh, but you just, you honor that, you know? Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that, you know, like in spending all that time, right, with Liz and her family, I got to this place where um, I really cared deeply about her and she cared deeply about me and I cared about her family and they cared about me. Um, and so, you know, when really emotional things are happening, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not a robot. <laughs> like, you know, I care about Lisa and when really challenging things happen for her, her family members, you know, they made me emotional too. And I, that's okay. You know, <laughs> it's okay to kind of like be emotional along with other people. Um, you don't, you don't want to steal, steal their emotion or, or crowd their space to sort of be able to express what they're feeling. But, um, but I think, yeah, it's okay to kind of, it's okay as a journalist to, to really care. And that's something I really learned with this, through this process, right? That like, we're not just sort of passive absorbers of information you know I'm not just there to be a sponge right I'm there to be a human being I know you touched a bit about this but AJ was just asking um, is there something about daily life on a reservation that you found interesting that perhaps your readers may not know um, a lot of this is throughout the book certainly um, I don't know if there's anything you can pinpoint for us hmm um, I mean, it, just to remember, right, that there are like over 500 um, federally recognized tribes in the US and so many different reservations. Um, and so, you know, uh, and everyone with their own culture and um, unique, uh, you know, set of traditions and, uh, and their unique kind of like family, you know, family culture, right? Like each of us probably has a very different family culture here. Um, but you know, um, I mean, the thing that like sticks out for me most is um, is the humor. <laughs> um, can I place an order for pickup, please? <laughs> um, can I get an order of? Lisa is, um, <laughs> Lisa is, you know, she's hilarious. We spent a lot of our time laughing together and um, her family is hilarious. And, um, and there's also, there is this kind of like pan indigenous humor, um, which I've been learning more about. There's like huge comedy movement in um, Indian country in general, like, you know, comedians who sort of go on the casino circuit and many comedians who have like emerged onto the national scene sort of from that history, like humor is a really big part of tribal culture, um, like across the board. And, um, and so, yeah, I, it's, you know, maybe partially emerges from like a lot of the trauma that people experience, um, but it also is just sort of like an innate part of that culture in a way that's just like so fun and and uh, and makes it makes like sitting with that darkness, like a lot of the darkness in my book or a lot of the darkness in Moses' life, it makes sitting with that darkness so much easier um, to sort of have that duality. Our final question comes from Kelsey. Um... Uh, so it, it sounds like you you built up that trust with Lissa, but was Lissa trusting and open with everyone um, involved in the missing persons case? Um, you know, because I imagine when you were kind of seeing her interact with others, was she a very trusting person as well? I think part of the reason why so many people tell Lissa so many things is because she's very open. She's she's very open. She's, you know she protects herself to a degree for sure um but she has this energy about her right and this honesty about her where she'll tell people at the drop of the hat that she's gone to prison she'll tell people that she was addicted to drugs you know she'll tell people that she lost her children right and so a lot of the families who are calling her for help right, or a lot of the people who might be involved even in a crime or might be implicated in those crimes, um, they come from a background like she comes from. And so they feel an amount of trust with her that they wouldn't feel with law enforcement. And that's why she's so effective at what she does is because, you know, people trust her enough to tell her things 
that she um they, they trust that she's not gonna like judge them for it. You know, they they feel less shame in telling her those things. As far as whether or not she's that open with them, I mean, she she tells them, I think enough for them to feel comfortable, but of course, you know, there are all kinds of things she sort of keeps, keeps to herself. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much to Sierra Crane Murdoch for this hour of just really, really interesting conversation. And uh, I hope you all finish or purchase um, the book mm -hmm. Yellow Bird. I think you will really enjoy this long form journalism. Thank you for coming tonight. And thank you so much, Sierra. Thank you so much. This has been a joy. <laughs>